Welcome to our fifth author this evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and our writer, speakers, and ideas series for the semester. My name is John Barr, and I'm a history professor here at Lone Star College, Kingwood. Tonight, we have Rice University philosopher George Schur, and more on his biography in just a second. Uh, so let me explain the format for the evening. Once I uh, read George's biography to you, he is going to uh, give his talk, and at, after which time, uh, I will uh, ask him a question or two, and one of his uh, ex-students, who is a philosophy professor here at Lone Star College Kingwood, Anthony Carreras, wave Anthony so everybody can see you right there. Anthony uh, uh, will also have a question, but we will take your questions. You can either put them in the chat box or in the Q&A box, and we will get to as many of those as we possibly can. So, uh, George Schur is Herbert S. Autry Professor of Philosophy at Rice University. He works in the areas of moral, social, and political philosophy. His publications include uh, Desert, 1987, Beyond Neutrality, Perfectionism and Politics in 1997, Who Knew, Responsibility Without Awareness in 2009, and Equality for Inegalitarians in 2014. His talk tonight is entitled, You're Not Trying. Well, we'll see. <laughs> At one point or another, he argues, most of us have been accused of not trying our hardest and most of us have leveled similar accusations at others. <clears throat> the topics discussed in this talk will include what trying one's hardest involves, the conditions under which such accusation, accusations are true, and the question of how much their truth actually matters. So without any further ado, welcome George Scher, and we'll turn it over to you. Okay. Um, thank you, John. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, I'm just going to try to noodle around with the picture here. Well, I won't bother. Okay, so this talk begins with a little dialogue that I suspect a number of you have been party to on both sides. So I'll first read the dialogue and then I'll talk about it. So the dialogue is between two people, um, one a complainant and one whom I label an accused sluggard. And it goes like this. The complainant says, you're not trying. And the ac accused sluggard says, I am too. Complainant, not hard enough. Accused sluggard, I'm trying as hard as I can. Most of us ha have participated in dialogues like this, both as complainants and as accused. Having done so, we know how intractable the disputes are and how difficult they are to resolve. We also recognize, albeit dimly, the, dim, the deep and complicated issues that surround the relevant notions of <clears throat> effort, will, and ability. My aim in this talk is to bring some of these issues to the surface by examining a number of representative examples. The questions to be addressed include, one, what trying one's hardest involves, and two, the conditions under which complaints about lack of effort are true, and three, how much their truth matters. So section one. To bring out the range of contexts in which agents can be said not to try, consider the following six cases. Case one is called hot reactor. Ben is a reasonable and cooperative person, but he is a hot reactor. When he encounters a traffic jam, a food spill, or some other minor inconvenience, <clears throat> His first reaction is to bellow and fume. Although he quickly calms down, his outbursts greatly upset his wife, Ruth, and he repeatedly and sincerely promises to resist them. When he fails, as he just as repeatedly does, the dialogue invariably ensues. Case two is called Jaunty Angle. Ruth abhors filth, but is indifferent to mess. Her books, manuscript pages, used coffee cups, and unfolded clothes are strewn haphazardly around the house. Since childhood, her propensity to leave every screw top at a jaunty angle has left a trail of toothpaste smears and pickle juice spills. 
She periodically resolves to be neater, but rarely notices the disorder that surrounds her. Whenever Ben musters the energy to point this out, his observation funnels them into the dialogue. Case three is called Fairies. Haley, Ben's secretary, just can't get the hang of moving text around in word. Whenever Ben tries to explain, her mind strays back to her plans to augment the collection of glass fairies that decorate her workspace. Despite Ben's efforts, efforts to pull his punches, the conversations that ensue are recognizable as versions of the dialogue. Case four is unemployed. Isaac, son of Ruth and Ben, has been between jobs for two years. He occasionally checks in at the putting hands to work office, but is easily discouraged when nothing is available. It sometimes occurs to him to look around on the internet, but his unimaginative searches quickly devolve into gaming. Whenever Ruth and Ben point out that he might display a bit more initiative, the dialogue begins. Case five is moving day. Charles and Risha are Ruth's friends, and Isaac is helping them move. To avoid an extra day's charge, they need to return the truck by 9 p.m. This is possible if they work steadily, but Isaac is pleading fatigue and taking, incre taking increasingly frequent breaks. Finally, with the deadline drawing near, Risha initiates the dialogue. In case six, the last case is called breaking through. <clears throat> Ruth is nearly done with an essay that she's been working on for months. Although, although the essay holds great promise, Ruth has not fully worked out the relations among its elements, and her facile ending reflects this. When Risha gently prods her to think harder, the dialogue again ensues. In each case, there is something, trying, that the AS professes not to be able to do, and to, not to be able to do any more of than he is already doing. And our guiding question is when, if ever, such professions are appropriate. However, before we can address this question, we will have to get clearer about the somethings that we are dealing with. When agents say they can't try any harder, what are they saying they can't do? And what, if anything, do their claims have in common? Are there as many ways of trying as there are occasions for the dialogue? Is there a single core form of effort that is common to all the cases? Or does the number of morally important ways of trying lie somewhere between these extremes? Okay, part two. To work our way toward answers, it is useful to imagine how some of our dialogues might continue. Let us therefore suppose that the Ben of hot, hot reactor, the Isaac of moving day, and the Ruth of breaking through are each asked why they think they can't try any harder. What kind of answer might each give? Where the Ben of hot reactor is concerned, the natural answer is that his loud expostulations are not within his control. They are as automatic as withdrawing one's hand from a hot burner or blushing when embarrassed. It may be possible to keep your hand on a hot burner if you're prepared for the pain, but it doesn't seem possible when the pain takes you by surprise. And just so, Ben may insist that he has no more purchase on his initial expressions of frustration than he does on any of his other reactions to occurrences that take him by surprise. We may imagine Ruth objecting that Ben wouldn't bellow if he spilled his coffee in class or if someone cut him off when the dean was in his car. But we may also imagine Ben responding that the fact that his automatic reactions are restricted to certain contexts doesn't make them any less automatic. The response that we can expect from, from the Isaac of moving day is very different. Although he too may plead a lack of control, his appeal will not be to the unmanageable immediacy of the situation, but rather to the strenuous efforts that he has already made. His paradigm will not be the reflexive withdrawal of a hand from a hot stove, but the muscle depletion that limits a weightlifter's repetitions. Just as an accumulation of lactic acid reduces the amount of force that a, lift, that a lifter can exert, Isaac will represent the accumulated impact of his previous exertions as reducing the amount of willpower that he can now muster. We may imagine Risha re remarking that Isaac would somehow manage to keep working if he had a gun to his head. But we may also imagine Isaac replying that the need to escape death 
is a powerful supplementary motivator that is simply not present in the current case. Ruth's response in bre breaking through will be different again. Whereas Ben and Isaac both know what to do or not to do, but view themselves as incapable of doing it or not doing it, Ruth's explanation of why she can't try harder to end her essay is precisely that she doesn't know what to do. Because insight is a gift, because the muse can be courted but not coerced, Ruth will insist that the understanding she lacks is not something that can be willed. She's already performing all the familiar courting rituals, getting a good night's sleep, rehearsing her argument in the shower, trying out various additions and deletions, and so on, but nothing has worked. Thus, when queried, she will reply that trying harder to find the right ending makes no more sense to her than trying harder to wiggle her ears. Taken together, these examples suggest that there are at least three ways in which an accused sluggard can attempt to deflect the charge that he is not trying as hard as he can. To do so, he can argue either that, one, the behavior in question is too automatic to be subject to his will, that two, although the required acts or abstentions can indeed be willed, he lacks the strength of will to perform them, or that three, his repertoire of available actions doesn't include either the required act or abstention itself or any others that will indirectly yield the desired result. I will turn shortly to the question of how convincing these responses are. But before I do that, I want briefly to examine their relevance to our other three cases. When we ask how Ruth might extend the dialogue in jaunty angle, how Isaac might do so in unemployed, and how Haley might do so in fairies, do we encounter only instances of the patterns of response that have already emerged, or do their best answers take some other form? Ruth's best answer in jaunty angle is clearly a variant of our first pattern. When she is asked why she can't try harder to put things away or screw tops on correctly, her natural response will be that her insensitivity to her surroundings and the habitual nature of her routine movements both serve to prevent these actions from even presenting themselves as possibilities. In this case, as in Hot Reactor, the most convincing explanation of the agent's inability to try is that there is no moment at which she recognizes the need to try. Because they share this feature, both explanations are of the same basic type. But not so the explanations that Haley and Isaac seem likely to offer in fairies and unemployed. It is true that when Haley's thoughts wander from, from what Ben is saying, the resulting lapse of attention is not something she chooses. But it is also true that we often do choose to concentrate in ways that prevent our thoughts from wandering. Although we cannot advance our understanding by brute force, that is Ruth's problem in breakthrough, we often can do so by forcing ourselves to concentrate on what others are saying. Thus, when Haley loses her focus when Ben is explaining how, how to highlight the portions of text that need to be moved, her lapse is best viewed as a failure, failure of will, and her claim that she is trying as hard as she can is best understood as a claim that her will isn't strong enough to sustain a greater effort at concentration. Here the proper analog is not Ben's failure to recognize the need to restrain himself in hot reactor, but rather Isaac's purported lack of willpower in moving day. Our final example, unemployed, is all, also the least clear cut. For the feckless Isaac seems deficient in both imagination and willpower. Given this double deficit, we can imagine Isaac defending his claim that he is trying as hard as he can to find work by arguing either that, one, he can't think of anything that he might do to increase his chances that he isn't already doing, or that, two, he is so discouraged and tired of trying that he just can't bring himself to do any more. Because the latter argument implies that there are other actions that would improve his chances, the two rejoinders don't seem fully consistent, but that need not concern us here. For present purposes, what matters is simply that whichever rejoinder Isaac makes, his way of extending the dialogue will conform to one or another of our original patterns. It will be analogous either to his own earlier plea of exhaustion in moving day, or to Ruth's appeal to her lack of options in breakthrough. 
Although this hardly shows that the three cited pat patterns exhaust the field, it does suggest that they, they demarcate the territory from which any deeper inquiry into the upper limits of effort must begin. Okay, section three. When someone says he's trying as hard as he can, his aim is generally to escape some form of blame or censure. Thus, one obvious test of whether the person has successfully defended his claim is whether the truth of what he says in its defense would get him off the hook. Guided by this test, I now want to turn from the question of what it means to say that one cannot try any harder to the question of when, if ever, such claims are defensible. My answer to this question is a bit complicated, not very. On the one hand, although I am willing to concede that the class of agents who genuinely cannot try any harder is not completely empty, I don't think that class has many members, and I doubt that those who occupy the AS position in the dialogue are often among them. However, on the other hand, I also think that even when an AS is cap capable of trying harder, it is often possible for him to escape condemnation by invoking his modal situation in a more nuanced and normatively inflected way. In the remainder of my discussion, I will defend each claim in turn. To bring out my reasons for thinking that most ASs are capable of trying harder, I will again enlist our familiar characters, and I will again begin with the Ben of Hot Reactor. Because Ben's explosiveness has been an issue of long standing, Ruth's complaints about it are bound to have a diachronic component. They're bound to have occurred over, over time. Um, when he erupts, and she complains that he is not trying hard enough to control himself. We can take her to mean not only that he's not putting forth the maximal effort right now, but also that he hasn't previously been doing everything he can to prevent displays like the one to which he is now subjecting her. The fact that her charge has a di diachronic as well as a synchronic component makes the task of rebutting it significantly harder. For in order to do so, Ben will have to establish that he is fully maxed out in both dimensions of effort. As I have prevent, presented it, Ben's explanation of why he can't try harder is simply that his outbursts come upon him so suddenly as to be anterior to deliberation and will. One way in which Ruth might contest this explanation is by calling attention to the many contexts in which Ben's recognition of what he has reason to say or do is no less immediate than his recognition of his situation that provides the reason. However, to block the implication that he doesn't need a period of reflection to appreciate his reasons for not blowing up, Ben may reply that he can only think this quickly when his mind is not swamped with emotion. Because this rejoinder is not obviously incorrect, Ben may indeed be on sol solid ground when he rejects the synchronic version of Ruth's complaint. But even if he is, the immediacy of his outbursts will at best explain why he can't try harder to suppress them at the moments when they are triggered. It won't explain why he can't try harder in the intervals between them, try harder in the intervals between them, to prevent him from himself from having more of them. To, to establish that he is trying harder in this further way, Ben would need to show that even in the coolest of hours, he is incapable of performing any further actions whose aim is to eliminate or reduce the frequency of his subsequent eruptions. However, despite the obscurity of the causal pathways to this outcome and the uncertainty of the prospects for achieving it, Ben is surely in a position to perform many actions that would have a non-zero probability of success. He might, for example, be able to diminish the force or frequency of his explosions by talking to a therapist, by wangling a prescription for tranquilizers, taking up yoga or meditation, pledging to eat another disgusting thing for each additional 30 seconds of fulmination, or simply reaffirming his resolution to Ruth every morning over breakfast. While none of these tactics is guaranteed to work, indeed, even if none seems at all promising, 
Each is something that Ben could do with the aim of eliminating or diminishing the frequency of his outbursts. Because doing A with the aim of bringing about B just is trying to bring about B, there are all ways in which Ben could try harder not to explode. And just as the Ben of hot reactor could make more of an effort to alter the causes of his objectionable behavior, so too could the Ruth of jaunty angle. Like Ben's choleric outbursts, Ruth's disorderly ways have been a long-standing problem. And like Ben's outbursts too, they are rooted in a feature, in Ruth's case, her lack of awareness of her surroundings, that removes them from the realm of will. Just as the recurrent nature of Ben's outbursts will lead Ruth to complain, not only that he is not trying his hardest to suppress them when they occur, but also that he hasn't been trying his hardest at other moments to eliminate them, the recurrent nature of Ruth's slovenliness will lead Ben to lodge complaints of both sorts against her. Moreover, just as the diachronic version of Ruth's complaint is borne out by Ben's failure to do various things that might damp down his temper, the diachronic version of Ben's complaint will be borne out by Ruth's failure to do various things that might cause her to become more aware of her surroundings. She might, for example, have accomplished this by festooning her computer monitor with post-it notes, by signing up for a, for a course of aversive therapy, scheduling re regular reminder phone calls, or authorizing Ben to post photographs of the most egregious of her messes on the internet. Because there are many things that Ruth could do with the aim of causing herself to become less disorderly, the fact that she has not been doing any of them will, be, will mean that Ben is right to say that she is not trying her hardest to be neat. Hot reactor and jaunty angle are not the only cases. This is section four. Hot reactor and jaunty angle are not the only cases in which the behavior that elicits the dialogue takes place over a period of time. The Isaac of unemployed hasn't worked for two years. The Haley of fairies has repeatedly failed to pay attention. The Ruth of breakthrough has been working on her ending for weeks. And even the Isaac of moving day has been slacking off for hours. In view of this, won't the complaints to which their behavior gives rise also have a diachronic element? And if so, then won't the fact that they haven't been doing everything they can to alter the problematic behavior also show that they aren't trying their hardest? Although I do think that none of these agents is likely to be trying his hardest, I don't think extending the argument of the preceding section is the best way to establish this. There are indeed at least two problems with this strategy. The first of which is that not all of the relevant complaints have a diachronic component. When Risha and Charles complain that Isaac isn't trying hard enough to finish loading the truck, they clearly don't mean that he could have been doing more in the past to modify his character or environment in a way that would cause him to rest less frequently now. What they are saying is much simpler that Isaac isn't trying as hard as he can to keep working when he feels the urge to rest now. And neither, albeit for a different reason, can Risha's complaint about Ruth include the claim that she isn't doing every, everything she can to cause herself to see her essay more clearly. The reason this cannot be any part of Risha's complaint is simply that Ruth is doing everything she can to cause herself to see her essay more clearly. That, after all, is just what courting the muse is. Here again, Risha is saying something simpler, namely that when Ruth is actually writing, she isn't doing enough of some elusive but recognizable thing, we might call it bearing down, that she will need to do if she is to break through her fog. The other problem with the strategy of basing the claim that our remaining agents aren't trying their hardest on their failure to do everything they can to alter the causes of their behavior is that whatever is preventing them from trying harder now may also have impeded any past ameliorative efforts. This problem isn't raised by what I said about Ben and Ruth, because the factors that account for Ben's explosiveness aren't operative when he's not exploding. And the factors that account for Ruth's messiness don't impede her ability to step back and ask how she can improve. 
However, if the Haley of fairies were asked why she hasn't tried to improve her concentration, she might well reply that figuring out how to do this would, would itself require more concentration than she can muster. Similarly, if Isaac were asked why he hasn't taken any steps to alter the pessimism and lack of energy that have been holding him back, he might well reply that he just can't summon, summon the energy to throw himself into a project that is so unlikely to succeed. When I say that Haley and Isaac could offer these replies, I don't mean to suggest that they are satisfactory. I think, in fact, that neither is. But I do mean that the proposed strategy is at best a sideways move. Even if we replace the question of whether Haley and Isaac are trying their hardest to do what's required with the question of whether they have been trying their hardest to become more able to try, we will have to confront some version of the question of whether they are operating at the outer limits of their willpower. So are they operating right at these outer limits? Should we accept Haley's claim that she just can't force herself to concentrate long enough to absorb Ben's explanations? Does Isaac really lack the strength of will to keep working until the truck is full and to keep pounding the pavement until he finds a job? That depends, of course, on how we conceptualize willpower, but that's not an issue I can engage with here. Thus, to keep things manageable, I will simply rely on the approach that I find most plausible. Following Richard Holton, I will assume that, I'm quoting Holton here, willpower works very much like a muscle, something that it takes effort to employ, that tires in, a short, in the short, short run, but that can be built up in the long run. Holton's analogy, which not coincidentally is just the one I attributed to Isaac earlier, is appealing for a number of reasons, not the least of which is how well it dovetails with the psychological literature on ego depletion. A variety of studies have shown that the amount of effort that a motivated agent can devote <clears throat> to a demanding task varies inversely with the amount of effort he has recently devoted to other, not necessarily similar, demanding tasks. This suggests that just as each person's physical constitution imposes an upper limit on the amount of weight he can lift, or the speed at which he can keep running over a given span of time, each person's mental constitution similarly imposes a limit on how much he can concentrate or, pers or persevere over any given period. On this view of the matter, our question about Haley is whether the amount of willpower that she would have to exert in order to follow Ben's explanation from beginning to end exceeds the amount that is available to her during that span, while the question about Isaac is whether the work he has already done has depleted his stock of willingness, of, of willpower, to the point where he can no longer persevere. Because Haley and Isaac exist only in imagination, these questions have no objective answers. But because Haley and Isaac are stand-ins for the sorts of real-life people who would say the things they say, we can address the questions by imagining what we would say if confronted by people like them. And what I at least would say is what I have already envisioned Risha as saying to Isaac, namely that you would somehow manage to keep going if you had a gun to your head. This is surely true. And the Isaac who would have enough willpower to keep going if he were under threat is the same as the Isaac who claims that he cannot bring himself to keep going now. When it is viewed in this light, Isaac's imagined reply that having a gun to his head would provide him with additional motivation will actually work against him. For by implying that he could summon the will to keep going if he were sufficiently motivated, he is in effect conceding that his previous exertions have not exhausted his current stock of willpower. Because this is so, and because a similar response could presumably be extracted from Haley, we may reasonably conclude that neither she nor Isaac is making a maximal effort now. But what finally of Ruth, considered now under the aspect of embattled essayist, when Ruth stares at her monitor, the one that is un unencumbered by post-it notes, is she also capable of making that extra push that will finally bring the strands of her essay into focus? This question is harder than the others because the gun to the head argument doesn't work as well here. 
because Ruth's problem is precisely that she precisely that she doesn't know how to end her essay. It is far from obvious that her performance would improve with a gun to her head. And neither, therefore, is it obvious that this counterfactual supports the conclusion that she isn't trying as hard as she can now. Yet although these things aren't obviously true, they're not obviously false either. It's been established by stipulation that before her writing sessions, Ruth does everything she can to make them as productive as possible. However, because what actually goes on during those sessions can itself be decomposed into a further set of mainly mental activities, it remains possible that being under threat would motivate her to replace some of the less effective of these component activities with others that are less pleasant, but more effective. Spurred on by mortal fear, or by a publisher's deadline or the tenure clock, she might finally be moved to consider abandoning the elegant section that doesn't quite fit with the rest of the essay, or to continue rereading the manuscript until she can finally hold all of it in her head at once, or to embrace the disturbingly dark conclusion that she has been shying away from, or simply to stay put until each roughly right next sentence or transitional phrase occurs to her. These are all things a writer can do to bear down. But because they are hard, it often takes willpower to do them. And because the gun to the head test may indeed show that Ruth isn't doing as much along these lines as she could, it may also show that she, like Isaac and the others, isn't trying as hard as she can now. Section five, final section. Yet even if she isn't, it doesn't matter much. For the important question is not whether a person's inability to try harder is sufficient to get him off the hook, but rather whether it is necessary. Moreover, when we ask this question, we find that trying one's absolute, absolute hardest is generally not a requirement for avoiding censure. Although a person's efforts are indeed relevant to our ability to blame him, what matters about those efforts is not why he could try, not whether he could try even harder but only whether they measure up to some independent normative standard. To see why this is so, we need only remind ourselves of what genuinely trying one's hardest can involve. For one thing, because every moment at which an agent isn't performing whatever action he think, thinks would have the best chance of achieving a desired outcome is a moment at which he could be trying harder to achieve it by performing that action, genuinely trying one's hardest will often require taking some action at every waking moment. In addition, if the best way for agents like Ben or Ruth to alter their future behavior is to commit themselves to undergoing some form of unpleasantness whenever they have a lapse, then for Ben, trying his hardest may require following through on his pledge to eat a bowl of cockroaches, or worse. While for Ruth, it may involve acquiescing in a series of very public humiliations. And again, even if Isaac were to lug boxes without respite from dawn to dust to dusk in the hot Texas sun, the fact that he would continue through the night if he could thereby gain a fortune or avoid being killed will mean that he is not trying his hardest when he stops after 15 hours. But whatever else is true, the efforts that an agent must make if he is to escape censure will rarely, if ever, blanket his waking hours rarely, if ever, involve repeating, repeatedly subjecting himself to deep disgust or abject shame, and rarely, if ever, require pushing on until he collapses. Even if Ben and Ruth and Isaac could make a lot more effort than they actually do, it is hardly reasonable to expect them to go to these lengths. To avoid imposing such requirements, we will have to refine the test that we have been using to determine whether an AS's efforts are sufficient to get him off the hook. Instead of taking that test to require that the AS make as much effort as he can, we will have to take it to require only that he make as much effort as can reasonably be expected of him. This is, I think, all that any sane complainant has ever really meant, but making it explicit sheds new light on what is really at issue between the parties to the dialogue. For if what determines whether an AS is subject to censure is not whether he's tried his hardest, but only whether he's made all the effort that he could reasonably be expected to make, 
then the most likely point of disagreement between him and a complainant is not whether he could have tried harder, but rather whether it was or is reasonable to expect him to do so. When an AS says he can't try harder, what he standardly means is not that this is literally impossible, but only that it is either so difficult or so morally problematic or so undesirable in some other dimension that it would not be reasonable to expect him to do it. When it is understood in this way, the dialogue is transformed from a purely factual dispute into a predominantly normative one. As so trans transformed, it raises a variety of new questions, both about what determines how much effort any accused sluggard can reasonably be expected to make, and about how the discussion's normative turn affects what we should say about Ben and Ruth and the others. However, to provide ad adequate answers to the first set of questions, I would have to say far more about a variety of predictable subjects than I have either space or patient for, patience for. While to address the second, I would need to draw both on that discussion and on many details about the six cases that I have not yet provided. To save on both length and tedium, I will not do any of this, but instead will end with a simple and brutal exercise of authorial prerogative. Here, with brief commentary, are my own summary judgments about whether each of our agents has tried hard enough to avoid blame or censure. One, Ben in hot reactor. I think Ben is blameworthy, but I'm not entirely sure why. I take seriously his claim that his initial outbursts are too spontaneous to be subject to his will. But I also take seriously Ruth's observation that he wouldn't have an outburst if the dean were in the car. He clearly wouldn't hesitate to blame someone whose spontaneous reactions involve punching or ki kicking or spitting rather than yelling. And this suggests that there are cases in which the only efforts to alter behavior that satisfy the reasonable expectation test are ones that succeed. Two, Ruth and Jaunty Angle. There's more time to undo a mess than to suppress an outburst. So Ruth has a greater range of potentially effective ways of altering her behavior than Ben. Whether she can reasonably be expected to adopt any of them depends on whether she could do so without wrecking her routine or paying an unacceptably high psychic price. I suspect that she could. Three, Haley and fairies. How much concentration does it take to absorb a five-step explanation? Assuming that Haley is of normal intelligence, I don't think she has much of a leg to stand on. Four, Ruth and breakthrough. This is a complex case. Many, though not all, of the ways in which a writer can try harder require some form of intellectual courage. And to that extent, Ruth's failure to bear down does appear to reflect badly on her. On the other hand, because she is, so, is strongly motivated to find an appropriate ending for her essay, we may also assume that she has at least considered some of these moves, and hence that at least in her own scheme of things, the benefits they offer don't justify the costs. Thus, overall, whether she could be reasonably expected to try harder is unclear. Five. Ben in moving day and unemployed. There's nothing unclear here. Some people are just lazy. That's it. All right, thank you, George. And I want to uh, encourage everybody to type in your questions. Uh, you can type them into the chat box or into the Q&A box. And what we're gonna do here, uh, I'll ask a question and then uh, Dr. Carreras will ask a question. That'll give the rest of you some time to uh, type in your own thoughts. So George, the question I wanted to ask you or touch on is how do you distinguish or can we distinguish between trying harder and trying more intelligently? <laughs> yeah. You know, so I mean, in what, 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 what distinction do you draw there between those two things, if, if any? <clears throat> it's a nice question, John. Uh, it 
it's certainly possible to exert a lot of effort in a very stupid way. I, I wrote a paper a while ago now called Effort and Imagination, in which one of my case, the cases I talked about was exactly uh, entitled Work Stupidly. Right, right. That's <laughs> a college professor who um, throws himself into his job and spends all his time walking back and forth between his office and the library, getting, you know, getting books, which are really heavy. Uh, and he brings them back to his office, um, but he never gets around to consulting them or anything. So he's putting in a lot of effort, but it's all very stupid. Right. right. Um, so uh, is he trying his hardest? I mean, assume he does it 24 hours a day. Okay, so uh, is he trying his hardest? Um, so, I, I mean, I've been inclined to say no, because part of trying is uh, thinking through what it is that you could do that's most likely to accomplish your aim. Another part of trying is doing it. Now, right, right. Uh, my imaginary professor, and I guess the person you you got in mind, scores really high on the second dimension, right? There's a lot of doing, but there's not a lot of thinking. But trying involves both doing and thinking. And um, I, I think uh, falling short in that first dimension also is a way of not trying one's hearts. Okay. That's yeah. a good question. It's really a good question. Thank you. Uh, Anthony, take your question, and then we... We have some coming in. Okay, yeah, this is, um, uh, th and thanks, George, for the for the paper. Um, this is probably more of a, a fleeting kind of comment than a, than a question. Uh, but it, it occurs to me that there's another version of the dialogue um, where instead of saying I'm not trying as hard as, uh, instead of saying that I'm trying as hard as I can, the accused sluggard says I'm doing the best I can. Mm -hmm. And um, that seems like, I mean, maybe not in every case, but it seems like uh, implicit in that is the idea that I, I could try harder, but if I did, I know I would fail. And so I, I wonder if, because it seems to me like the central insight of this paper is this idea that um, no one is actually trying as hard as they can. And what really matters is whether they're living up to this appropriate normative standard. And, and I wonder if that's actually more uh, reflected in the ordinary person than uh, you might think. So I'm interested in this idea. Um, uh, I'm not trying as hard as I can, but I'm doing the best I can. And right. I mean, my first reaction was, <laughs> what's the difference exactly? And But you gave an explanation of the difference, that there are some, some trying things that you might do, but you know they wouldn't work. Um, if you're sure they wouldn't work, then do they still come within the sphere of trying for you? I would think not. I mean, trying is doing something which you think has some chance of succeeding and bringing about the outcome you seek. So if you, you say, well, you know, I could, uh, I could have a seance, um, but I don't believe in that stuff. Um, uh, you sure that wouldn't work, or um, or um, my imagination is failing me, but you get the idea. Um, but so then you're not doing it doesn't count as not trying. Well, but you never know, right? I mean, it could work for all you know. <laughs> oh, okay. But then I'm doing the best I can doesn't really go either, right? Mm. Okay, George, here's a question. Okay, from, yeah, fair. Yeah. Here's a question from Carrie. Uh, and Carrie's question was is one that I had thought about. And it says, if people start with little willpower, and here I'm thinking along the lines, I don't know if they were, but thinking along the lines of maybe genetic predispositions or something like that. But if people start with little power, with little willpower, how are they meant to acquire the willpower that gives them the strength to grow their willpower. You know, if you're, if, if you know, is there some type of genetic uh, uh, deficiency or uh, 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 surplus that allows some people to try harder than others? 
Yes, this is actually a, a vexed question about effort. Um, um, and so, so two things. I, I mean, it's it's really a, a, it's 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 a it's it's a question about psychology, right? It's an empirical question. What works? And I don't know. Um, but uh, I can tell you an answer that Anthony will like. Uh, it's the Aristotelian answer: practice, practice, yeah. practice. Right. Um, and yeah. I, I mean, I think that's what Holton has in mind when he makes you know the the the, the muscle analogy. Um, I mean, I'm a little bit skeptical of the. <laughs> Anthony knows this. I'm a little bit skeptical of uh, that we can uh, uh, do much to improve our characters by. Uh, miming good character action, or you know, that's that's not fair. <laughs> by um, by acting in the ways that uh, we want to acquire the habit of acting in. Um, I mean, once you reach a certain age, you're probably too far gone. You have to do this when you're young. I, mean, I think he says. <laughs> <Yeah. sort> of. <laughs> right. how, how young, Anthony? Are, are, can you still do it? Well, no. Once you hit thirty, like the the, the <laughs> empirical literature suggests, you're 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 uh, you're, you're a little too far in. <laughs> I see. I see. Hey, Aristotle, Aristotle needs empirical psychology. Okay. Yeah. George, this is a question from Tiffany, and it's related to Anthony's question. And Tiffany wants, she says, how does one know we are actually doing the best we can because everyone has a different definition for what the word best means? Give an example. I think it's a hard question, actually. But, like, if, um, if Ben knows or believes, simply believes, that there is this thing that he could do, that would have, that in his view would have some likelihood of causing him, uh, causing him to blow up less often. If he knows that, you know, tying himself to the mass like Odysseus, uh, uh, pl pledging, uh, I am going to eat a, three cockroaches for each for each thirty seconds. Uh, 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 of the next explosion um, until I calm down. So he knows or has reason to believe that, uh, yeah, this is going to, this, this may well, may well have some effect, and he doesn't do it. Um, I would say that would be sufficient to establish that he's not trying his hardest or doing his best, because there is this thing that he thinks he could do that would, would be trying. And he's not doing it. Um, so that's a sufficient condition for not trying your hardest. Um, that there are things you know would have some likelihood of success and you're not doing them. Um, that's the best I could do r right now. Um, I, mean, it's, I mean, it's funny about effort because, like, we know from the inside what it is to be making an effort. And we also know when we're not going full out. Right. I mean, if you uh, you're playing baseball and you, you hit a ground ball and, you know, it's uh, you might be able to leg it out. But um, you just don't go full out. And like, you know it. Right. You know, yeah. I, yeah. I, I could have run harder. Um, sometimes we know it from the inside. Sometimes there are things that we know that we could do that would have some prospect of success. So those, those, are, those are ways in which we might know that we're not trying harder, we, that we could try harder. But I guess the harder question is, how do we know that we're trying our hardest? And I don't have an answer to that one, just right off the well, top. The next question is kind of similar to this. This is from David, and I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use Isaac as an example here. But David's question is, in a situation where Isaac could do something, but he chooses to find a more intelligent way to get it done with less effort. And Isaac succeeds. And Isaac try his best. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah. Uh, more power to him, right? Because uh, trying is doing something with the aim of bringing about whatever you want to bring about. And the way, the way this example is set up, he, I mean, he is doing that. 
It's just that he's not sweating as much. And I, I think it would be a very silly way of understanding trying your hardest to equate trying your hardest with sweating the most uh, or, or make, uh, um, doing the mo having, uh, uh, making the most motion or something like that. that that's, that's not it. Okay, here, here's a question that this is from Jarrett. And is there, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but I think I'm getting the gist of the question right. Jarrett, you can tell me if I didn't, but is there an objective way to tell if someone is doing their best? Um, is it the, is, is it Jarrett? Is the question, um, is there an objective way for the complainant to be able to tell whether the accused sluggard is doing his best? Or is, is, it the, is it the accused sluggard who uh, is supposed to have a way of telling whether I think, I think it's uh, what maybe what Adam Smith called that impartial spectator, you know. Okay. How, okay. How can you, <laughs> sorry about that. But, you know, how, the, the question literally reads, how can you tell if someone is doing their best? So I'm, a, yeah. I'm assuming, uh, you know, he means that the, the, not the sluggard, but the, the complainant. Yeah, um, this is very similar to the previous question, and I, I, I want to give the same answer that I, that I gave. I think it's easy to tell when someone's not doing his best. Um, you, you, you know, you've got, got, a, got a ball player who gener generally uh, legs out this kind of, kind of hit, and this time he doesn't. Uh, he's, not, he's not trying as hard because we have, you know, we have, ev have evidence from the past. So I think we can tell when people aren't doing their best, but I, I think it's much harder to tell when they... Um, are doing their absolute best. Okay, this is another, there's a question. Uh, I think this is another athletics questions. I think athletics kind of lends itself to this, right? Yes, right. From Sahib, what is the difference between trying your hardest and pacing? For example, in some races, if you try your hardest too soon, you burn out and you finish dead last. Yeah. So how do you, how do you understand your limits in the context of, uh, of, of trying here? Okay, um, look, trying is relative to a goal, and the goal is winning the race. And so, if tactically it's better to hang back until until the home, you know, until the final lap or something like that, because um, that's the best way to win the race, then you're trying your hardest by doing exactly that. Um, as, as I as I said, I guess in response to the previous question, um, trying your hardest doesn't doesn't mean exerting the most energy necessarily. Um, it's doing everything that you can um, uh, to accomplish your goal. And that okay. may well be involved pissing yourself. Okay, so that was that was Alton's question, uh, where uh, I assuming he but said, so trying your best would be accomplishing your task, even if you didn't put in 100% effort. Um, but, but look, we, we want to sort of separate different uh, ways of thinking about effort. Um, think about my work stupidly example, right? Uh, this faculty member is lugging this heavy pile of books back and forth to uh, library to office, office to library. So he's putting in a lot more effort than, uh, than the, his, his counterpart who you know, thinks carefully, well, I need these three books, but I don't need them yet. So I'll, you know, I'll go in three days and I'll just get these three books. Um, so in one sense, the guy, the guy that works stupidly is doing a whole lot more effort than the other one. Um, but if making an effort uh, is, is sort of pegged to doing what you think will accomplish your goal, um, then the person who isn't sweating as much, isn't grunting and sweating as much may actually be making uh, more of an effort, right? Because maybe you know the aim is to prepare for class or to or to write a paper or something like that. And if, if that's the aim, you're wasting your time if you just lug books back and forth from the library. This is a follow-up question from Tiffany, and this is a very practical question. She's she says, how can one of these scenarios help help someone budget or save money? <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm just going to beg off. Uh, I, I don't see any very direct connection. Uh, let me think about it for just one second here.
Well, sure, it would have something to do with it. Would it would have something to do with thinking intelligently about how to budget? You know, well, right. um, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't think the scenarios that I've presented um, uh, make direct contact with the idea of um, going about it intelligently versus going about it unintelligently, and that came up like in the in the discussion. But but yeah, that's that's the that's the closest I can come to uh, sort of you know practical uh, a practical moral to draw from all of this. Okay. Close. Um, all right, we've got uh, one final question here, George. This is from Steve, and the question is: You teach academically elite students at Rice. Do you ever feel any of them aren't really trying, or even that some, like Isaac, are lazy? And if so, what do you do about it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask if Anthony was ever lazy. Yeah, no, Anthony is not lazy. No, um, no. Actually, I mean, I, I, I've taught at other universities. I, I taught at a large state university, and I taught at a not very good private university. Uh, earlier in my career, and um, this is going to sound like a plug for Rice, but I mean, one thing about Rice students is that they are—they're pretty hardworking. I mean, they you know they are they are dedicated. Um, it, it's not like I've never had students who don't who don't try so hard. But what do I do? Well, it's it's reflected in their grade, and that's that's the reaction. George, we've had two more questions come in. If you have time for them. Uh, no, I got to run right out. Yeah, sure. Of okay. Course. This is from Calvin, and Calvin asks, "When does feedback perhaps become a hindrance? When someone truly believes that they are doing their best, and then they get feedback telling them something completely different?" Oh yeah. There are two ways in which that could happen, right? I mean, the feedback could be true, but just very discouraging. Or the feedback could be uh, false and given by someone who either doesn't see things correctly or wants to undermine you. And I think you know both of those kinds of feedback can really sap your initiative. Um, I, I agree that happens. This is absolutely the last question. This is from Noreen. She asked, Dr. Sher, how can you identify who is working their hardest and who is working stupidly? We all do things in a different way. Uh, how do you make that distinction? Um, the way I make the distinction is that um, okay. I mean, one question is: Is there a truth of the matter about which which means are the most effective way to accomplish an end. Mm -hmm. um, I think probably yes, but I don't want to insist on that. But the question was, how do you distinguish? Or how do you, how do you um, tell? And my answer is, if I see someone doing something that, in my opinion, is not the best way to accomplish the end, and if I think that information or conclusions or inferences about better ways to accomplish that person's end are available to that person, then I conclude the person is working stupidly because the person either uh, is not paying attention to what he knows or isn't drawing the right conclusions from easily available information um, and um, he could do better, so he's working stupidly. Well, here's the working well and saying thank you. We appreciate uh, the paper. We appreciate the insights. I'd like to thank all the students who took the time to listen in. And those were some very good questions, I think, that we had. Good questions, yeah. And uh, I know that uh, George appreciates those. Don't forget, we uh, have an author next week on environmental policy in the United States. I think that should be quite fascinating. And George, Lone Star College, Kingwood, and certainly Anthony and I would like to say thank you very much.
Be sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like this video, leave a comment, and hit that subscribe button to be notified about our latest content.